welcome to this Dementia Life created by Dementia Action Alliance. Our website is danow.org. I'm your proud host, Chuck McClatchy, and I live my dementia life with Alzheimer's disease. During the Dementia Life podcast, we will have conversations with inspiring people living with dementia and the amazing people that care about us. My guest today is Dr. Stephen Post. In his spare time, he's an author, but he, he's a professor of family, population, and preventive medicine, founding director of the Center for Medical Humanities, Compassionate Care, and, Bio, and Bioethics at the Stony Brook um, uh, Medical College. Dr. Post, why don't you, I, I, your, your book that you just put out, it's, it's Indignity for Deeply Forgetful People. You know, how the caregiver uh, can meet the challenges of Alzheimer's disease. And it takes such a different approach. What kind of inspired you to write a book like this? Well, to be honest, I never liked the word dementia because it is a, a language of decline, of some decline from a former mental state, de menta. And I much prefer uh, this expression in the title of the book, Dignity for Deeply Forgetful People. Because, you know, um, there is a spectrum of forgetfulness and we all experience it at varying levels over the course of our lives. We try to make careful distinctions, but sometimes it's not so easy. And I want people to think and understand that despite silence or uh, confusion, there is always a person, a continuing identity underneath everything that can be reached with good communication skills, with creative arts, with music, that we should never think of these individuals as gone, as husks, as shells, as empty, uh, but we should afford them absolutely equal status under the protection of do no harm and kindness, we should honor them and recognize that the differences between them and us are really not all that great. It, it seems like your book, it, it doesn't go down the <clears throat> tragedy narrative, which everything or just about everything people see on TV about dementia is negative. It's always on the, the tragedy side. You know, here's the white flag. You know, nobody has ever gotten one. It's not curable right now. And, and all, this is what people hear from day one of being diagnosed with dementia. How important is it for people to have hope, you know, and to have something that they can look forward to in coping with it? Well, in Dignity for Deeply Forgetful People, I actually have a chapter on hope. And I define hope, uh, Chuck, as being open to surprises. <clears throat> because, in fact, if you look at what caregivers say, and if you read the literature, there are always these moments when um, lucidity just somehow is there to a greater degree than would normally be the case. It can be prompted, uh, but this idea of being open to surprises, I was doing a, a presentation several years ago at the New York Times building in New York. It was a really interesting event. And one of the uh, people who attended emailed me later and she wrote that um, I cared for my mother for many, many years and every once in a while, she would tell me, God, physics, and the universe. And it turns out she was a physics professor. So you, if, you, if you look at the narratives of caregivers, there's always, for those who want to notice, who want to take the time to be listening and attentive and hear the whispers, uh, 
there's always something there. There was a guy I knew who was really quite severely forgetful and he would come in and he would do artwork in the mornings <clears throat> and he would draw the same lines, look a little bit like a tree trunk down the middle of the page. And uh, I would ask him, always expecting an answer, even though most would say one wouldn't come, um, what are those two lines? And then one morning he blurted out, that's a map so that my daughter can find her way to my house. And these things are so common. In the book I emphasize, I, I, one of the problems with Western ethics and Western culture is we put so much stress, Chuck, on linear rationality. You know, can we project plans into the future and operationalize them? Actually, if you read Buddhism and you want to live in the now, the best thing you can do is spend a lot of time with deeply forgetful people because they're mostly in the now, but not entirely, not by no means entirely. So there are these wonderful continuities and you just have to work at them. You know, these people with deep forgetfulness, they're, they have full consciousness. They're aware of the colors of the sky, the smell of the fall leaves. Uh, they can be creative. They can enjoy music and they can sense the presence of others uh, in very subtle ways. Uh, so in, uh, I have it up here on my wall, actually, in 2015, I was invited to do the plenary address in India at the Indian Institute for Advanced Studies. And the title of the conference was Consciousness, Cognition, and Culture, Implications for the 21st Century. And I was saying that there is absolutely no reason at all to disrespect somebody because their memory is less intact than someone else's. On the contrary. So that's, of course, a big contrast to what sometimes goes on in Western culture. In the Nazi period, there was the Tiergestrasse 4, the T4 experimentation, where in 1939, they took about 60,000 people out of asylums with probable uh, dementia. And that's where they started the hypothermia experiments. They, they froze them in the ice. They laid them down on the snow. And then they brought them in and they thawed them out at different temperatures in, in different gradients, hot air, water, and so forth. Of course, it was completely preposterous. And these were not discriminated against groups. These were not Jews or gypsies or gay folks or whatever. These were Aryans, if you will. But they had something going against them. They were deeply forgetful. And that meant they could literally be tortured. So after a year and a half, the German people finally were able to put an end to T4. But the same two physicians, psychiatrists who were in charge of T4, went directly to Dachau and Auschwitz, and they perpetrated the hypothermia experiments on these discriminated against groups. So the point is that medical ethics and I'm a medical ethicist, reached its low point in history. It began with the deeply forgetful. I loved Leo Alexander, who wrote the Nuremberg Code. He said, he, he saw all this in German. He said, the best thing you can do for people with these kinds of conditions is to create a voluntary association around them, to protect them. Something that's between the state and the population. Some, some group that has a special interest an advocacy interest. And that's why the Alzheimer's Association is so important. And I've had a lot of joy over the years working with the Alzheimer's Association. But Clint, you know, he loved his hat and he knew who he was. And if you really look deeply at it, that's why pastoral care can have a role. Even when people are at, their, at the near, near the end of their lives, uh, they can still be clutching a rosary bead. I knew a woman in, in New Haven who, um, was a very distinguished lady. She became very deeply forgetful. But when she went into the Yale Chapel and heard them singing familiar hymns, she just chimed in. She just chimed in. And it was like she was completely herself. She would get somatic and rhythmic because a lot of memory is, 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 is somatic, is bodily. And um, 
she would start uh, uh, smiling and being joyful and then even be able to engage in some limited conversation to the surprise of people around her. So my point in all of this, anyway, when I went to, when I went to uh, uh, India, I was in this, in this hall and there were about 200 people there. And these were Hindu philosophers, Hindu neuroscientists, physicians. You know, It was a very colorful saffron robed group. And right in the middle of my talk, in walks this guy and I see him in the back. And I think I kind of recognize him, but I'm not sure. And he sits down, nobody bats an eye. And after I'm done, he stands up and everybody turns around and looks at him. He puts his hand down on the table and he says, you're absolutely right. There is no reason to value someone less because their memory has weakened. And that was His Holiness the Dalai Lama himself, who apparently spends a lot of time in, 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 uh, in you know, at, at that center, at that, at that institute. I didn't know that. But if you go to the airport uh, um, uh, there in Bangalore, there's always a lot of uh, monks and, you know, people who look like they're from Tibet floating around. But that's the main point here is that we as a culture, we don't know how to handle uh, forgetfulness and we are also derogatory. The word dementia is used in a derisive way. And so that's why, you know, the title of this book, Dignity for Deeply Forgetful People, how caregivers can meet the challenges of Alzheimer's disease it's very carefully chosen. Yeah, okay, so I've been for the last 40 years, you know, I traveled all through the US doing ethics conferences with uh, chapters in literally every state and every city and up in Canada, I did, I did the US guidelines, I did the Canadian guidelines, I was on the national committee in Chicago um, and so forth, et cetera. So I have a long history and I've been writing things about, you know, do you really wanna use a feeding tube in a guy who's 92 and is really at the end of his, of his druthers, you know, and, 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 or just let it, let it go and, and, and do assisted oral feeding. So I'm, I'm an advocate of assisted oral feeding and, and have practiced it most of my life. And I do that even to this day, but there are many, many, many questions. Um, you know, what about freedom and safety and what about the drugs and are they really any good? And, and, um, you know, on a scale of one to 10, um, where do they put you if, if music and memory is a seven, a lot of the a lot of the drugs that we have are maybe a, a 0.05. They just you know they they do a little something but not much, and I say that as someone who was involved in the research on these things. So I'm not against them, but I but but we don't we don't have a magic bullet. When it comes to Alzheimer's disease in particular, we have made very very little pharmacological progress. We don't even really have a scientific model, yep. you know. But that's not to be pessimistic. The thing is that Americans, for some reason, but many people in different parts of the world, they, they put all their hope, you talked about hope, Chuck, you know, they put all their hope on a pill, you know, and they're waiting to be able to go down to the drugstore and buy it with or without a prescription and voila. But actually, Alzheimer himself, Dr. Alzheimer, Alois Alzheimer, did not think he had discovered a disease that could be medicated. I went with Peter Whitehouse, great neurologist, on a Lily Learjet about 20 years ago to Mark Bright, Germany, where Alzheimer lived and was born and worked. And that's now owned by Lily. <clears throat> and all these great German historians, they said, you know, he really thought he was observing a natural aspect of an aging brain. And, and it was his boss, a guy named Kropotkin, who said, we got to get Alzheimer's, a disease named after him. So they said Alzheimer's disease, but he didn't agree with it. <clears throat> and so, the, the, you know, the, the point is that, you know, that, and by the way, if you go back 15 years, some of the epidemiology people, they thought, well, okay, so we can study folks now in their late 90s, and we'll probably see if you get beyond 85, you're home free. Not true. What the studies show is that when you get into the late 90s, about 60 or 70% of individuals have this have, have severe memory loss. 
and join the ranks of the deeply forgetful. So it's not as though you get you get beyond this. And I think Alzheimer's believed that if we all lived long enough, we'd probably all be deeply forgetful, which actually it's 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 a, it's not a great thought. But look, I mean, the, the idea that somehow we all may share this destiny at some level. But it's not just the ethical issues, you know, what, what you know, when do you use the A word in the diagnosis? Do you want to do a living will? Do you want to do a durable power of attorney? Do you, you know, what about this, that, and the other thing? What about driving privileges? Those are all in the book and they're all important. And I offer very practical solutions learned from caregivers in 50 states. But the, the point is, you know, what is our basic mindset? What's the basic frame? that we view these individuals through. If we view them through a frame, just think of a frame, you know, uh, looking out into the world beyond you, you know, if we look at them through a frame that tells us that they're not gone, that, they're, that, that, that they don't remember our name anymore, you know, and that, you know that, that they don't matter, which is what our society really teaches because after all, I mean, you, 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 this is a very individualistic, society where people pride themselves on being independent and productive economically and intellectually. But maybe, you know, maybe that's just the wrong framework. And maybe what we learn, and this is a big theme in the beginning of the book, what we learn from deeply forgetful people, we learn that we are not independent, we are interdependent. And when we come into this, story, Chuck, this holds for you too. When you came into this life, you were completely dependent on your beloved mom in every way, way, shape, or form. And a lot of times when we get very ill, you know, you have a spinal cord injury or whatever, you're completely de dependent. You, you know, you're on the, you know, you're, you're sort of heading toward what the African-Americans call Beulah land, you know, and, and you're completely dependent for a while in a hospice or whatever. So how, so actually the, 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 the human condition, if we're humble and honest about it, is one of interdependence and also vulnerability. So I talk about interdependence and vulnerability and how dementia teaches us what it means to be human. Good, we're almost out of time, but there's one thing I always ask, you know, guests that I have on. If this podcast is the first thing a person just diagnosed or a caregiver who's <laughs> His partner was just diagnosed. What would you tell him? I would tell him, you have every ounce of creativity that you ever had. You know, the artist de Kooning in New York here, he was a crazy son of a gun. He got in a lot of fist fights in Greenwich Village. He was an abstract expressionist. He was really anxious about life in his painting. And he was a great painter. He was diagnosed with probable Alzheimer's at NYU. And for 14 years, he lived in a loft in Greenwich Village with, a, with, with a, a basically a liaison. And um, he would dip his paintbrush sporadically in acrylic and he would go up to the easel and he would paint. And when he, when he died, there was a posthumous exhibit of his artwork. He painted for 13 and a half years. There was a posthumous exhibit in the Museum of Modern Art of his work. And some of the, some of the reviewers, they just dissed him. I like the word diss. They said, oh, he's a husk. He's not, he's, this is an embarrassment to his legacy. He was a great artist. All the complexity is gone. All the sheer anger and anxiety is gone. But no, actually his paintings in that period are a lot more like Georgia O'Keeffe. They're like beautiful flowers. He did a lot of flowers. And, and, and it's like somehow or another, he, he, he had deep forgetfulness, but what I think what he forgot was this crazy idea in Western culture that I don't do nothing for nothing, you know, and, and, and don't cross my path. And, and he just got rid of all that garbage. And he just came in touch with his true soul, with his true being. And he began to realize the beauty of a flower. Thank you so much for taking the time. I know how busy you are and, you know, I, I can imagine what your schedule is like, but thank you so much. I think this is really something people need to hear, you know, to have just a little bit of hope, you know, in the future 
and to not dwell on what can't happen, but what you can do. So thank you so much for being on it. Thank you for the book. Got to change the narrative. <laughs> exactly. A negative sign with a line over the top of it is a positive. Yep. I don't want to be Pollyannish, but look, this book, this, I'm just looking at this, this book now, Dignity for Deeply Forgetful People. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, um, it's endorsed by Dr. Joe Martin, the Dean Emeritus of Harvard Medical College. Charlie Scribner, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, who says, in addressing themes such as consciousness and interconnectedness, this book will contribute to the flourishing of the deeply forgetful. From the Dalai Lama himself. That's the, that's the message. We got to completely recraft the narrative. Total, 100%. Exactly. And this is a heck of a start. I want to thank you for joining us today. You can view other podcasts on our website, dnl.org. Click on podcast. Please join me to meet the most inspiring and amazing people on this dementia life. I'm your host, Chuck McClatch. Remember, the brain may forget, but the heart never will. I will see you next time on this dementia life. Thank you.